that's a rich sponsor right there. That was a repetition. It's not natural. People will be able to tell. All right. I only put Picasso's Guernica in front of you now because I've mentioned it to you. And I consider Picasso something of a representative of modernism in art, as well as in uh, uh, what is sometimes called perspectivism. Know also that he had a blue period, a pinkish red period, and that sometimes he, uh, and, and that another one of the periods that he had was a Judas period. Um, he's known for being a very tech technically proficient artist, and yet he, he paints and draws in ways that showcase, um, you might say, a theory of perception or even a theory of being at the time in which he was existing that is not purely representational or that is not descriptively representational in the way the traditional, traditional sort of Renaissance 16th century art is, which is highly realistic, for example. Or, or say you see a sculptor uh, like the Rape of Persephone, which is a very famous sculpture where um, even the, the fingers that are grabbing uh, Persephone's is, uh, backside by, um, by Pluto, the god of the underworld. You can see the indentions in her skin, the marble, which is her skin, showing this high level of technical mastery. When you see Picasso's work Guernica here, you see something very different. In fact, if you look very closely at the faces, even the bull's face, you notice that the perspective is wrong, that there is something missing here, a distinction between two and three dimensionality, that faces do not look like this bull's face. He seems to be looking in portrait as well as forward at the same time. And so I encourage you to see art like this, which has an abstract element to it as carrying itself a perception of what art is and a perception of what human perception is. He is saying something about the time in which he exists and how humans see that which surrounds them. If it looks chaotic, this is in the wake of a huge war and also a very huge, terrible battle and bombing as well. I mean, I think you even see all the way to the left here what seems to be something like a blown up, dismembered body. And so this is a violent image. And so this is a violent time. That we are talking about. It would be difficult to find a time in history that was not extremely violent with humans, and yet the time between World War One and World War II, it, uh, I would say, uh, to just put it in a cliche, which means kill the meaning of what I'm saying, uh, uh, it takes to kill. All right, we've talked about the first three chapters. Oh yes, my little correction sheet here, I, I said that this text is like a triptych. That was me uh, sharing my reading, but not my Knowledge of how to speak, a triptych, there's no such thing, but there are triptychs. Yes, absolutely. And so that's online forever for everybody to see my mistake. They'll also see my correction. They can uh, read. Uh, second thing is that I said that the Odyssey, I know it to be split into two, but sometimes I haven't seen it split into three. This is just a just a straight up error. Um, the Odyssey is obviously split into three. The first four books feature Telemachus and his perspective are called the Telemachia. The next uh, books, five to 14 or so, are called The Wanderings of Ulysses or Odysseus. And then the final 10 books, he's on Ithaca and he, he, he battles the suitors. So the Odyssey, like Ulysses, is also split into three. Um, okay, good. Today we're going to focus on the second part of Ulysses, which is modeled off of the second part of the Odyssey, which features the perspective and doings of Mr. Leopold Bloom. Um, so I hope very much to get through all three of these chapters, um, and I'll do my best. Mr. Leopold Bloom, et with relish the inner organs of beasts and fowls. He liked thick giblet soup, nutty gizzards, a stuffed roast heart, liver slices fried with crust cones, fried pincods rose. I don't even know some of these foods, by the way. Most of all, he liked grilled mutton kidneys which gave to his palate, fine cane, a faintly scented urine. And this is our hero. Doesn't he sound like a hero? Glorious, tall, victorious in battle? No, he sounds like a sensualist. This is an individual who likes to eat. And more than likes to eat, I say sensualist because he also likes to uh, look at ladies and feels um, some uh, various romantic sexual urgings. So of course we know that because of the death of his son, Rudy, who died at 10 or 11 days of age, he has not lain with his wife 
in 10 years. And so he looks for romance in more abstracted ways. Martha Clifford and his uh, pin pal romance with her, also checking out a lady, walking him into a, a carriage, and then later uh, staring at the lame girl, Gertie McDowell. And there are also other mentions of this happening. But this is a person who is very much firmly embodied. Unlike Stephen, who is uh, like, a, like a, a headless intellectual or a, a head without a body, as it were, sort of like a balloon floating off everywhere. Stephen thinks, but he thinks impractically, he thinks theoretically. His thoughts get him nowhere, and in fact, often disorient him and lead him to uh, retracing steps that he does not know that he has already walked through, like somebody who walks in a circle through the same. And perhaps you know that it, it is, in fact, a psychological phenomenon that if one gets lost in the woods, one often walks in circles. Uh, yes, and our, our woodsman knows this. Yep, and this is something worth knowing about your son. In any case, this Bloom character is very different from a traditional medieval ancient hero. But something that he holds in common with Odysseus, on whom he is modeled, is that Odysseus also is somebody that has a care for what he eats. Now, he is sensual in that he definitely has a romantic sexual side. He lays with Circe, he lays with Calypso, he seduces Nausicaa, he even lays with his wife after defeating 108 suitors the very night that he's done this. And so he also is embodied and sensual. But what I'd like to draw your attention to here is that um, sensual appetites, um, particularly eating, gluttony, uh, is the vice of that in the Middle Ages, the God they speaks of, or lust, are very much tied together. That in Dante's Middle Ages, he says that these are both vices of incontinence, that they the one who gives in to lust or gluttony lacks self-control. Something about Bloom that he shares in common with Odysseus is that they are both very temperate, moderate, sober individuals. In fact, something that will be said about Bloom that is one of the many things that differentiates him, distinguishes him from those around him who have simpler, often denigrating views of him unjustly, is that you ask Bloom to get a drink and he takes out his pocket watch. What does that say about his character? It says at least one thing, but I think two things is very important about. Somebody asks him to get a drink, and the correlate with us would be you take out your phone. And then you're like, oh, I got this text, or something like that. What, is it, what does that say about his character? That he doesn't just say yes, and he also doesn't just say no. Give it a shot, give it a shot. He has to make sure it's the proper time to be drinking. It's not five o'clock. No, sure, sure, but what does that say about his character if he's checking the time? If he's not just giving in to his desire? Others of not drinking at a time to drink. Maybe, maybe, but what could be the other reason that he checks his watch prior to saying yes? Yes? Why would you say yes, self-control? <laughs> okay, I like that. Uh, yes, what? He values his time, and in fact, he values your time. Someone who just says yes to everything might as well say no to everything. Because somebody who is a yes person is not going to be able to keep his, her, or their commitments. He takes out his watch to see if he can say yes, which shows that he think he is thoughtful, we would say. He, he goes the extra step. He doesn't just say yes, of course I'd like to go get a drink with you right now, like somebody who is an alcoholic or a drunk, like Miles Crawford, whose face is perpetually red because of his drinking. And, um, and, and, and it also means that he wants to drink with you, but he has to make sure that he has the time. So it's not as if he doesn't like drinking like everybody around him, but rather than being compelled to drink like an alcoholic, he still has the choice to do something that he enjoys. You see the major difference in consumption there, right? Even though he might be drinking across from somebody, the fact that he has control over himself makes this a delightful thing that he can take pleasure in, whereas this is more like what? A necessity for some of the people around him. They're either drowning their sor sorrows, like Simon Dedalus, who's in a very difficult spot with his 15 kids and his inability to make money. Uh, you may have noticed his young daughter 
uh, Millie uh, selling their things away so that they can uh, have enough money to feed themselves. They're in a tough spot. Stephen even feels this when he sees his younger sister with the French grammar, and he thinks about how she's a pale version of him in the same way that uh, Millie, uh, Millie Bloom is a pale version of Molly. And he, he thinks about how she is drowning in the same way that he imagines the person who is drowning that Buck Mulligan saved earlier. And he knows that he can't save. This is a very, I think, poignant moment that uh, Stephen has grown up and has gotten an education and is employed and can support himself. But his many siblings who do not have the talent that he has, who knows what the outcome for them will be. And it certainly seems the case that he can barely help himself. Can he help anybody else? Now, I think this is one of the painful moments that one has to struggle with in this text. These moments of limitation and a clear darkness uh, looming over the Daedalus family. Uh, it is very unlikely that only the mother will be the one who dies over the next few years. But in any case, Calypso is the name of this chapter, chapter four. And Calypso is the island nymph uh, on the island of Ogygia with, with whom Odysseus is trapped at the beginning of Homer's Odyssey. Uh, he has been with her for seven years, seven years, but no longer finds her com com or her company satisfying. In fact, when we first see Odysseus, also very heroically, I say ironically, he's crying on the beach, right? This is not exactly what we think of as heroic behavior. You know, maybe at the end of the movie, after they've won the war and their friend is dead, and we're like, yeah, you have a heart too. But at the beginning of the story, there is the whole Iliad, so we know he's a hero. But uh, it is an... Uh, it is an ignominious way of introducing a character that is supposed to make a huge impact. It's supposed to be, in some ways, greater than we, uh, that somebody towards whom we should strive. Um, Odysseus, too, does not enter Homer's story until book five of Homer's Odyssey, in the same way that Bloom does not enter this story until chapter four of Ulysses. And Bloom, like Stephen, is a thinker. He's very smart. But he's a practical, pragmatic thinker, not a theoretical thinker. And so he thinks about the fact that he needs to look into his other pair of pants and get his keys. He forgets, but he forgets things too. Um, in fact, he, he forgets the ingredients to the lotion that he needs to get from the apothecary for a model as well. There are things that he forgets when he's thinking about so many other people. But he thinks about uh, important things that will help the people around him to notice that this is something that the people around him give him no credit they do not know the character of this man. They simply know his identity. What do I mean when I say this? He is seen as an outsider to most of the people with whom he interacts in this text. But Mulligan will compare him to the wandering Jew, for example. Even his uh, his own uh, his own friend Martin Cunningham, who defends uh, his father against the charge of, of 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 suicide, not the fact that he committed suicide. He obviously did. He suggests that it's from a temporary insanity. It doesn't bring great shame. The, to the family. Even he, when he sees a Jewish moneylender in a carriage alongside uh, Bloom, says, everybody has been to him, and then he looks at Bloom and says, almost everybody. These are the sorts of moments that fill Bloom's day. Constant reminders that regardless of his character, his decisions, the things that he does for people, that he is always judged as outside that he is ostracized, that he is not one of the boys, as it were. And yet, he heroically strives against this misperception of him and maintains his character throughout the entirety of this text. And so if you would really like a character example of somebody who has to deal with catching a lot of flack from people who are perhaps not as morally upright as him all day long, every day, then will bloom as a great, great, Example. Some examples. Um, in this chapter, or rather in the next chapter, he'll be on his way to Paddy Dignam's funeral. Paddy Dignam, who himself was an unremarkable person who died uh, seemingly instantaneously uh, because of drink. He was an alcoholic. And so he drank himself to death. This is something that people are not mentioning in large part during the course of uh, during the course of the ride to the funeral of their father Tommy. Um, but Bloom will be an individual that inquires into the insurance that Patty Dignam had in order to get that to his wife so his family continued to move in a solvent manner. In fact, he will meet Martin Cunningham later to continue talking about this issue. So he's taking care of business 
while many other people are getting drunk. Like you know, from Miles Crawford, the newspaper man, Stephen Daedalus, several of the uh, the figures that we meet around 12 o'clock go out to lunch. What do they have for lunch? They have a liquid. They drink. So they start drinking pretty early. We'll also try and get a good deal for his client. He's an advertising man, by the way. And so you see, even in his choice of profession, that there's a connection between the artistic. Advertising is artistic, right? I mean, if you've ever seen the Mad Men and Don Draper, wonderful. But it's also highly practical. You use your art to make money. And so he, he occupies a middle point between art and practicality, the sort of middle point that we are very much concerned that Stephen Daniels will never reach. Uh, he does not himself see moderate in the same way that our sober blue is. And also, over the course of the day, he will start to keep an eye on Stephen Davis, develop paternal feelings for him as well. In fact, he's the first person in chapter five in the Hades chapter to notice that Stephen is walking on his way to Sandy Mount Strand to have his thoughts about the ineluctable modality of the visible and, and the auditory. Um, and mentions this to Simon Daedalus, in fact, who, who we always see, uh, we see him mention and take pride in his son, but we don't see them interact. We will eventually see Bloom and Stephen interact. And after these first three, after the first three chapters and these next three chapters featuring Bloom, we will start to see uh, chapters in which they cross paths, like in chapter seven in Aeolus. And then there will be alternating chapters, creating a sense of uh, expectancy for us. For when are these two, when are these, when is this figure of the father, when is this figure of the son going to come together? And note also that in the same way that Stephen Daedalus has lost his mother, has in some ways lost his faith, which is something like his, uh, which is represented paternally to him because of the Jesuit fathers who taught him religion, but also his father is not his father in some ways. His father is very much biologically related to him, but he is himself a drinking man who has squandered his artistic talent and has a humongous family. Stephen Daedalus has no children, no romantic prospects yet, but does have um, a very bright intellectual artistic future ahead of him if he can keep his head on straight, if he can be a little bit more sober than the terrible influence of Buck Mulligan, who's constantly uh, drawing him into uh, shenanigans, as it were. Um, so just a couple things about Bloom. As I said, he's an advertising man who will negotiate and work today, eat in the funeral, uh, go to the National Museum and witness Venus Telepigian, that means Venus of the, uh, of the, the how do we say it? The nice buns, as it were. Um, I mean, Kalos means fine, beautiful, and Pige is uh, it's butt. And so uh, the buxom buns, uh, as it were. And in fact, Buck Mulligan will observe, and this is something about Buck Mulligan's character, he catches people in their lowest moments. He will observe uh, Leopold Bloom looking at a, uh, a statue of Venus, uh, Aphrodite, and uh, looking at her macial groove, macial groove is of course the crack of the anus. Um, and uh, this is this is because Bloom can't imagine that even a goddess doesn't have a butt because he loves to eat, and to eat is to digest, and to digest is to defecate. And so, so you can see also that he follows interesting lines. I mean, something that's said, uh, you know, uh, by philosophers from Maimonides to Spinoza is that if one really follows the logic of a transcendent being, a transcendent being can't be limited by a body. And therefore, if it doesn't have a body, it doesn't eat, it doesn't speak, it doesn't defecate. And this is, some, this is a notion that blows Bloom's mind. And so he goes in a very practical way to check on a statue to see what, what it's got. Because he just, uh, well, he can't even imagine an existence without eating and all that, which is consequence. consequence. Ah, yes. In this chapter two, there is a letter that shows up at the door and that is for Molly Bloom. It should say, given the conventions in, in letter writing and marriage at this time, to Mrs. Leopold Bloom. It says to Mrs. Marianne Bloom with a bold hand. This is from her agent and promoter, Blazes Boylan, who at four o'clock this very afternoon, it's 8 a.m. in this chapter, will, uh, will, uh, eat in uh, Bloom's bed, see the connection again between food and sensuality, and will also copulate with Bloom's wife in his bed, and leave evidence of both, uh, by the way, that Bloom will find uh, unbelievably, uh, unbelievably, 
and in some ways. But some there are two songs that Bloom finds out Molly will be singing. One of them is called Lachito Room the Mind. This is from Don Giovanni. And in this song, uh, there's a duet portion where the woman who is being seduced um, sings Boré a non Boré. It's a time first person singular indicative conditional active. Um, uh, Bolio means I want, Boré means I would like. So Boré a non Boré means I would like and I would not like. This is somebody who's being seduced, who wants to lie with Don Giovanni, but obviously doesn't want all the implications of it and is supposed to be married to a man who is not Giovanni. So she's torn. But this is a song that Molly Bloom is singing. That Molly Bloom is singing uh, while Blaze is boiling is, uh, as McCoy uh, says, getting it up, as it were. And so even the nature of this song and when it is sung and the conditions in the opera in which it is sung, play on Bloom's mind. Seduction. Blaze is boiling. My wife. I haven't lain with her for 10 years. She's singing this song. In the same way that Bloom seeks romanticism and sensuality in abstract ways through Mark Clifford and conducting correspondence with her, um, I, all the ways that I've mentioned, seeing Gertie McDowell, checking out a lady walking in to her carriage, so does it seem that Molly Bloom is seeking for that same sensuality but in different ways, singing a song that is uh, part of a seduction that a woman is feeling that itself mimics the seduction that she is experiencing from Blaze's boiler. Uh, not to mention the fact that Bloom buys her romance novels, too. And so both of them are seeking something which I, I think ideally they would find in themselves, and yet they are seeking uh, what they are looking for in differing places, not in each other. Um, very famously, Bloom, uh, Molly has read a word, uh, metempsychosis, uh, one of the words that is the title to this course. And uh, he, she says, what's that mean? And he says, oh, transmigration soul. She says, oh, rocks, told he was that even mean? I don't know. Uh, and he says, it means something like when you die, your spirit goes on and can be reanimated into another uh in, into another body the idea of reincarnation is what the transmigration of souls is which is what metempsychosis is the transformation of a soul to one body to another body to another body time. people who, who say that they've lived many lives for example seem to believe in some version of metempsychosis so in my former life i was a 70 year old uh irish nun if I were to be the person that said that sort of thing, very much honestly rather than ironically, then um, then I would be somebody who is in that side process. Well, uh, the chapter ends uh, very famously with Bloom doing something that is not done in literature, that is still not done very much to this day, but I think has never been done. At this point, he goes to an outhouse, sits on the toilet, opens the newspaper, and well, finishes his morning constitutional. We are, we are treated to that image in this very modernist text. Uh, chapter five, The Lotus Eaters. By lorries along Sir John Rogerson's key, Mr. Bloom walked soberly, soberly, soberly. It's an adverb that very much describes the vast majority of actions that he takes. Past when the lane leases the linseed crushers, the postal telegraph office could have given that address too. He passed the sailor's home, and it was roughly so, the opposite of sailors. He turned from the morning noises of the quayside and walked through Lime Street. By Brady's cottages, you see all these real world details, Brady's cottages, Lime Street. A boy for the skins lulled his bucket of awful loot, smoking a chewed fag butt. In British English, a fag is a cigarette, and the butt of a cigarette is often where the filter is on sort of nice and safe. Not, not all cigarettes have filters. Obviously, if you roll your own cigarettes, you don't have these. There's a character who's smoking. The whole idea of the Lotus Eaters is that these are figures who eat, like so many characters in the Odyssey, inappropriate things. And this leads to uh, the doom of, of Odysseus' crewmates. In this case, it doesn't actually lead to their entire doom. But what happens is that we find out they don't eat bread. They don't eat nutritious substance. They exist off of Lotus, which some scholars actually think they found what the lotus from the Odyssey is based off of, and that it's a form of opium. And opium 
is itself a sort of drug that makes one uh, uh, lethargic and feel sort of warm. It makes one just kind of chill and do nothing. Um, and so this lotus, rather than uh, allowing individuals to be re-empowered and have the strength necessary to make it home uh, on the difficult seas, uh, makes them forget about their home and their homecoming. And so there are constant references in this text to the little sorts of pleasures that we have during the course of the day that allow us to forget. Smoking a cigarette, for example. How do people smoke cigarettes? You go outside five or 10 minutes, you smoke it, and you just take a break. Is that, in fact, if you've ever been, like I say, a waiter or a bartender and with a, with a smoker, it seems really unfair because they get a 10 minute break every hour. And which is, you know, can be sort of frustrating. And yet, it's it's allowed. Um, uh, I, I don't know if it's always allowed everywhere, but it's been allowed in the places that I was at. And, and so we, we get some other mentions here, too, of, of weak joys, of, of joys that sort of, um, uh, let's say, take us away from the narrative of a moment and allow us to indulge in a little bit of escape. So, so what do I mean? Well, Balloon passes a smoking man and then goes to an oriental tea shop where he imagines the lethargy of the East. He imagines so much lethargy and tiredness, he doesn't even finish his own thought. So tea, tea is itself a drug with caffeine in it or with a relaxing sort of substance in it like chamomile tea. Um, uh, he also finds his letter from Martha Clifford which he wants to read. And in this letter, we find out that he is conducting a written correspondence, a sort of cheating correspondence with a woman at whom he has given a pseudonym to, Henry Flower, very similar to his own name, Bloom, Flower, Flowers, Bloom, he's a connection between that. He's not very good at coming up with a hiding name. Maybe he's not trying to hide that well. Uh, it's something to keep in mind, but it says that he experiences weak joy. He then goes to a Roman Catholic mass and notices the incense, and it's dark and comfortable, and one hears strange words being spoken at one, which he thinks dulls the intellect. And so in dulling, he's like, oh, that's pretty smart, because people will just kind of relax and let it all flow over. And so what perforates this chapter are the sorts of um, sensations and small drugs that one can pursue during the course of the day in order to forget oneself in order to forget the path that one is on. And while Bloom is afflicted by these things and observing their effects on others, he is staying sharp. He is keeping his wits about. He has a more objective way of looking at the church ceremony. He is not himself a smoker and observes the smoker and thinks about why might one might be a smoker. And But that said, he does indulge a little bit in the Martha Clifford. And so is he totally um, is he totally uh, immune to the effects of this lotus? Uh, perhaps not, perhaps not. Well, in any case, Bloom attends the mass, as I said, and thinks of the intelligence of lulling people uh, with Latin. There he thinks uh, about his Irish Catholic wife, Molly, and the irreverent things she said about a couple of very famous Roman Catholic abbreviations. They are IHS and INRI. IHS, any of you know immediately what that means? Comes from the Greek name of Jesus, which starts with Yoda, not with a J, they didn't have a J, uh, which is Jesus. First three letters are Yoda, Epsilon Sigma, which are IHS. You see those all the time. INRI, where uh, those letters were inscribed above uh, on the crucifix of Jesus with the crown of thorns, as Pontius Pilate said, Ecce homo, behold the man. And what he's saying there is, look at your God. You know, you're hanging God, bleeding, beaten up right in front of you. And uh, and yet that is the image that the Christians taking for themselves. This comes from Jesus Nazariensis, Rex Judaiorum, which means <coughs> Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. <coughs> Interestingly, there was some, there, uh, in the medieval times, there's a story that was really well developed of a uh, figure called the Wandering Jew, who was himself a uh, a Jewish individual who made fun of Jesus as he dragged his crucifix um, to the mound where he would be crucified. 
And Buck Mulligan compares Leopold Bloom to the wandering Jew. And says, oh, I saw him. And he cast his eye askance on him. And also suggests a sort of homosexual relationship between, um, between Bloom and Stephen, which is perhaps his own projection of his personal romantic feelings towards Stephen, as we will find out that Bloom feels very much paternal, not romantic, or feels paternal, not romantically towards him. Stephen, uh, dead. <clears throat> Buck will say he's Greeker than the Greeks. The Greeks, the Athenians, of course, very famous for um, uh, systematizing the practice of the pederasts. So that's that's what he said. Um, all right. Um, Bloom then goes to Sweeney's to give the ingredients for a potion uh, or a lotion for Molly. Unfortunately, he's forgotten the ingredients. Yet yeah, something else he has forgotten. Um, and the chapter ends. And then had, had heading to a Turkish back bathhouse, excuse me, or, uh, to get clean, as it were, prior to going to Patty Dignam's funeral in the Hades chapter. Um, as he's sitting there, he's sitting there kind of recumbent like this, you can see his front. As he's looking at his front, he's not admiring himself so much as looking at his nether region. In his nether regions, he sees the hair spread out like a flower, a plant that he knows very well, which is itself called Father of Thousands. And he calls what he sees the limp father of thousands. Keep in mind, he only had one child, Millie. His other child, um, young Rudy, died. And he maintains this Jewish convention that the health of a child is related to the health of the father. And so Rudy died in his head because of him. He sees a limp father of thousands. This suggests it's not an ethnophallic image of a very potent image, of a very potent force, right? Um, the, the idea is that uh, there's something wrong with this uh, uh, this this uh, item, this object, that it could be a father of thousands, and yet because of its lack of uh, potency, that it's not. And so this is, to some extent, a reflection on his own impotency, his own lack of father, um, as, as he just gazes down, looking at himself in a bath in the morning prior to going to a funeral. There's many... Uh, a great moment in this. All right, I'm not going to have a ton of time to go through this, but I'm going to say as much as I can about Hades, Patty Dignam, and the funerals I can in the next five minutes. The first lines from this chapter are, Martin Cunningham first poked his silk-hatted head into the creaking carriage, and entering deftly seated himself, Mr. Power stepped in after him, curbing his height with care. These gentlemen are getting into a carriage, who all themselves go to the funeral of uh, poor Patty Dignam, who has drunk himself to death. In Book 11 of Homer's Odyssey, Odysseus travels to the entrance of the land of the dead at the insistence of Circe in order to speak to the blind seer Tiresias, who maintains his wits even among the floating chaves, the loose of minds. Only he still has them. Odysseus there learns of Elpinor and his mother, and Agamemnon's deaths while also seeing heroes of old like Heracles. Who is Elpinor in this chapter? I'll tell you how Elpinor dies. There is a drinking party at Circe's. All the men who have just been turned from swine back into humans are super stoked. And they drink and they eat. One of them gets so drunk that he walks up onto the roof of Circe's house and goes to sleep. And when he wakes up the next day, Oh man, that was, ah! He falls down and he breaks his neck. Who is Elkinor in this chapter? Who also was afflicted by drink? It's Patty. Patty Dignam, indeed. Very good. Very good. And so, here Odysseus learns in his own Hades that he will return home either alone, no ship, no crew, or that he will make it home or, or sorry, he will either make it home alone or not at all. And this is as a direct result of him calling out his name to Polyphemus, who then called down a curse from Poseidon onto him prior to him having lost all of the ships. And then uh, raising the question, was it Odysseus's identifying himself to Polyphemus that leads to the death of his remaining men? Which is, well, if we ever read the Odyssey together, a question that we'll have to think about more. So, back to Ulysses. They are heading to the funeral of Patty Dick. Leopold Bloom, Stephen's father, Simon Douglas, joins them. Bloom notices Stephen on his way to Sandy Mount Strand. Remember, because of uh, the use of spatial form here, that Stephen is heading to do what he does 
uh, at 11 a.m. in the same way that Bloom is heading to do what he does at 11 a.m. And uh, in this uh, in this chapter, not only in this chapter, but particularly in this chapter as a first instance, Bloom finds himself singled out and excluded at least twice in the carriage, not because of his character, but because of his identity. Um, uh, the, the first time is when the men in the carriage make fun of a local Jewish moneylender, as I mentioned. Uh, he's described as of the tribe of Reuben. That's what they're saying that he's Jewish. Uh, we have all been there, Martin Cunningham said broadly. His eyes met Bloom's eyes. He caressed his beard, adding, well, nearly all of us. Mm. Mm. Once at the mission, mention of suicide, his father, Bloom's father, Virag, who committed suicide as well. Martin Cunningham calls it temporary insanity. He's a friend of Bloom. He'll work with it later. He wants to limit the pain of this. But this is described by Mr. Power as the greatest disgrace to have in the family. He's saying this in the carriage with a man whose father committed suicide. It's tactless. And yet, this is the sort of thing that happens to Bloom all day long, every day. And then Bloom also remembers Molly and Boylan. Page 77, 20 past 11 was the time. Up, up. What does he think of when he thinks the word up? Who's getting it up? It's associative. You can't get away from it. Mrs. Fleming is in the clean, doing her hair, humming. Volio a non bray. No bray a non. He's thinking about the song of seduction. He's thinking up. He's thinking about the time. He can't get the fact that his wife is about to cheat on him out of his head. He's been uh, afflicted by Mr. Power saying that suicide is a great shame to a family. He's been afflicted by Martin Cunningham mentioning that everybody's been to this Jewish money line except for this, except for you. And so over and over again, his difference is made is made clear to him. All right, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, end with a, well, I'll say a couple things very fast and then I'll end. Uh, they also see the brother of Charles Stewart Parnell at the graveyard after the buggy has gotten there. And there are claims made, even though Parnell is dead um, and has lost his political force through having a very famous uh, a very famous affair with a, a married woman, um, some say, as it is expressed in the text, that Parnell will someday come back. Some say that he's not in his tomb, uh, that this figure of Irish independence will someday return. You can see the sort of idealistic imagining. Uh, Bloom, also claims, and this sets him at odds with those around him, though I think he is right to say this, that an instant death is the best sort of death. They're sort of horrified at him saying that. But I mean, if you really think about it, I mean, I personally, uh, my wife's best friend's mother was told that she had like nine months to live. I want you to think about it. And this happens to a lot of people. What do you do with yourself when you're told that you have a certain amount of time to live? Would you prefer to know how much time you have? Or would you prefer to just drop over dead one? I mean, I think about, you know, I, I might write something in my last few months or try and, you know, convey something, but it, it's really terrible knowledge to know when you're going to die. Um, and I mean, most of the things we do, we do thinking that the future will be better, right? Like you need a good diet. You do, like, once you know that time is up, can you even live in the same sort of way? And I, these are tough, I think these are tough questions to deal with. These are real questions. In any case, Bloom's pragmatic perspective on the body and death here. No touching that. Scene of the affections. This is his view on uh, reincarnation and the heart. Broken heart, a pump after all, pumping thousands of gallons of blood every day. One fine day, it gets bunged up, and there you are. Lots of them lying around here, this graveyard. Lungs, hearts, livers, old, rusty pumps. Damn the thing else. The resurrection and the life. Once you are dead, you are dead. This last day idea, knocking them all up out of their graves, come forth, Lazarus. And he came fifth and lost his job. You see, so makes a joke there. He came fifth. It's like saying you have a, you have a very big forehead, so big it's a five head. See, these are puns. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and get up, last day. And every fellow mousing around for his liver and his lights and the rest of his traps. You see how he problematizes this image. Even when you, you're you reborn, where and like some, you have to go find your liver that's been pulled out of you by one of these rats over here. You know, Thomas Aquinas actually writes about this. You've been cannibalized. Who gets that part of your body back in, during the resurrection, the cannibal or you? And these are interesting issues, right? If you really, really want to think about these issues, you can find 
cracks in the armor of the arguments. Though often we don't want to find such cracks, right? Because we just want to replace such uh, powerful images. And if you want, that's something to keep in mind. In any case, chapter ends with Bloom uh, letting John Henry Menton, who's a local solicitor and seeming like higher up, uh, letting him know that he's got a crinkle, a dent in his hat. Uh, Men stares at him at first, takes off his hat, fluffs it out, scrapes along his jacket, puts it back on, says thank you. And then we get to chapter seven, which we have to save until next time.